Welcome to Handled Internally, brought to you by PlayNow.com. Bomber fans, PlayNow.com reminds you that when you bet on blue, there's only one legal online sports book in Manitoba, only one that guarantees your winnings, and only one where the profits stay here to support your community. Play your bombers at PlayNow.com, your hometown sports book. Enjoy responsibly. And now, on to the show. And we're back for another Handled Internally podcast. I'm Ed Tate from BlueBombers.com, joined as always by Darren Cameron, the Blue Bombers Senior Director of Player and Public Relations and Chief Consigliere, and CFL All-Star Guard, Pat Newfeld. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, guys. How we doing? Good. Really good. Just uh, getting back into the swing of things, finished a nice little training session. There's myself and Kenny in there, and then uh, come here to join YouTube bums. Doing, doing dry January. Dry January, man. You got to cleanse. Not that you're a big drinker anyway, but... No, 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 not at all. Cleansing? Yeah. You've been doing fasting? No, nah, I tried fasting once, and Fuck, I don't think I did. You might want to try it. I don't... <laughs> well, then I wouldn't be a guard. I tried fasting once, and uh, I woke up one morning, and I fell over because I think my blood sugar was so low. Hey, you were telling me this the other day. I don't think I did it right, so I'm staying clear. So when you're done playing, are you gonna be? are you going to be one of the linemen that go up or down? Down. I'm going to have, I gave myself like a two week binge fest where I'm going to eat double quarter pounders. Oh, yeah. Basically, my post game meal every day. What's that? Well, it, it's McDonald's. Yeah. And it's double quarter pounder with cheese, junior chicken, and an apple pie. <laughs> Not as bad as Kevin Todd's order, <laughs> but it's close. <laughs> yeah, it's a good order. <laughs> yeah. So I'll do that for two weeks and then I'll uh, go back to trying to be a normal human. You can't ju- you can't you can't be this big for life, man. You can't do it. We were just talking about this before we came on. Bob Molly, who's in the Bomber Hall of Fame, played in the eighties, early nineties, was an Olympic wrestler, won the silver medal in the nineteen eighty four Olympics. When he retired, his wife came in with a pair of running shoes and said, Okay, now it's time to get back to a normal weight and he turned in he became a triathlete. Right. I don't know how much he lost, but he doesn't even look like the same person. What would so? What would you if this if you were just normal Pat Newfeld not playing? What do you think you would be? How much lighter? I, I mean, I, de- I think the ideal weight's like two fifty, two forty around there. Um, tough to battle genetics at some points, but um, yeah, probably swimming, some running, more yoga, just normal people things. Not have to lift heavy weights all the time, which will be a nice reprieve for the joints and, and probably normal dieting, <laughs> like eating normal amounts of calories. And um, yeah, that, that's probably the one thing I'm looking forward to after retiring, whenever that's going to be, is just feeling like a normal person. Do you feel during the season that you're like you're constantly having to eat? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so you eat when you don't even want to? Uh, not when I don't want to, but it's, you're, you're putting in a lot of calories, like big breakfast when we have a day one, day two practice. Um, usually we have our, our big lifts those days too. So have a bigger lunch and then, um, try to have another pretty big meal for supper and then constantly drinking water, constantly staying hydrated. So yeah, just the calories in is, is a huge thing. I, I'm not as bad as other guys like Chris Kolonkowski. He is constantly eating. His his metabolism is crazy, and he's like he battles to stay over 290. So he's he eats an insane amount of food. It's crazy. But for me, it's a little different. My metab- metabolism is a little different. You know, could you explain that a little bit, Pat? Because I don't know that everybody understands why you think you need to get to a certain number, right? Because I guess you just get pushed around a little bit then, right? Is that just basic science here? A, a little bit, yeah. Like... I think guys at this stage in their careers get to a certain point where they feel comfortable with their body and how their body feels. Um, certain guys go up, certain guys stay the same, certain guys go down. Um, it's more so you got to be at least over like 290. I, I know Chris Chris is different because he plays with leverage. He's he's going to hate me saying this, but he's shorter, so it's a little better. You can't He can't be like 320 pounds at – five nine or whatever he is <laughs> but uh <clears throat> he is gonna hit you yeah yeah he's not gonna like that but i think for everyone's different like i'm just under six foot six and i usually play around 315 and and stands around the same stands six four and he he'll play around there too so we're generally around that same spot i think it's just a requirement for offensive linemen you need to have that that mass and that weight to stop guys from hitting zach mm. 
So, man, how's the uh, how's the, the how's the new addition of the family going? It's She's been, awesome. Uh, it's, so you you called me the morning of the BC game. Obviously, you weren't there. You'd been up all night. The BC October road game, 6th yeah, or something like that. Yeah, yeah. October sixth. Yeah, yeah. It was, it's been amazing. I mean, that day was crazy. Um, you know, we were. I kind of had set. I talked to Osh, talked to Marty, and I was like, if the baby's not here by Wednesday, then like I'm not going to be able to go. Not going to be able to play. Just you know, want to want to be there for for Paula and for the for the birth of our baby and. Um, we were hoping and hoping and then Wednesday didn't happen. So, um, we kind of played the waiting game and then, um, ended up getting induced and yeah, our, our baby girl Hallie was born the morning, October 6th and, uh, healthy and happy baby. And it's, it's been amazing. We're, we've been really lucky. I always knock on wood cause she's sleeping like 10 hours a night and she, she has like half an hour nap in the day, but yeah, she's, she's been awesome. It's the best thing in my life for sure. So you were watching the, you were watching the game. In the hospital, yeah. You, after not sleeping for yeah, for basically twenty four hours not sleeping, and what a game to watch! The, what a game well, to watch! The in overtime the game yeah. that clinched first, yeah, yeah. the most important yeah. regular season game we've had all season, and it's my favorite place to play outside of uh, here in Winnipeg, and um, just that feeling of hopelessness because you can't help. You just I'm I'm a control guy, and when I couldn't go out there and, and help, I'm just antsy and walking around the room. So. As the game goes on, the game goes on, more and more nurses are coming in to check just the regular post-birth check and all that kind of stuff. And it was about midnight because the game went into overtime. That's when our little nurse came in to give Hallie her first bath. And I think that's when, just at that same time, uh, Parker made that tackle on Dominique Crimes. Mm -hmm. And I, like, erupted. I was, like, running around the hospital room, like, screaming. Paula was, like trying to calm me down because the nurse is walking in and she thinks I'm like a legit psychopath and <laughs> I'm screaming with this like 12 hour old baby um in the room and she's like what is going on with this guy and Paul is like uh oh, he plays for the team he couldn't be there today and she was like no nah, whatever and like yeah she didn't care at all she she I don't think it registered to her that I was a, a blue bomber and um you know we had just like dodged a bullet there and um yeah ended up going overtime and having that amazing overtime game and, and ever since then she's kind of been like my little <laughs> good luck charm what a day for your ticker man because oh, you're giving birth to your first kid and then the game goes into overtime i mean your yeah. that was your pulse didn't you I say something about it was like 160 my and like i checked my apple watch and i was i just like i just went for a physical i think mine was that too right now so that's <laughs> yeah, gotta be yeah. good <laughs> right yeah you should probably go to the emergency room um <laughs> My heart rate was, yeah, like 160. It was wow. crazy. I, I was so amped up. I mean, unbelievable game. I mean, back and forth, crazy things happen in that that are just like only in the CFL you'll see that stuff. And, uh, yeah, thank God we won. I got to ask the kind of cliche dad question about how it changes your perspective almost because, you know, <clears throat> after the Grey Cup game, Win or lose, the team's having a function, right? Hopefully, it's win. There's lots of beer and food. And it's you know, if you if it's done right, it's a celebra a celebration. It didn't work out the way we wanted to in Hamilton. After the game, though, I'm down there drowning my sorrows with a few other people, and you've got your baby with you. Yeah. And I thought, there's a guy that's already got it figured out, right? That and so just maybe walk through that because that kind of grounds you, doesn't it? Being a dad and have having your baby with you. Total perspective. I, I mean. That loss was the worst loss in my career, just based on how the season went and the amount of work, extra work and time we put in. Specifically, I'll talk about our offensive line and our quarterbacks. We put in a ton of extra work that whole year. We spent a lot of hours in our offensive line room going over shit. And uh, to fall short like that in a game, um, it fucking broke our hearts. And I mean, that locker room afterwards, and Darren can attest what you can attest to it. It was unlike any mm -hmm. locker room after a loss we've ever had. I mean, I I was crying. I mean, guys were upset. It was it was bad. And and I remember texting Paula, and I was like, all I want to do is just hold Hallie. Like that's the only thing I want. I I could care less about <laughs> anyone else. I just wanted to see her, hold her, because that was the only thing that was going to bring me any sort of happiness after that loss. And mm -hmm. um, you know, she's a little trooper. She stayed at the hotel until like two a.m. And Paul actually ended up missing, like, the team shuttle <clears throat> back to the family hotel. So we were like, fuck, like, how are we going to get our baby back to the <clears throat> the family hotel? And um, Paula's brother, my brother-in-law, is an amazing guy. And he came – he actually 
took an Uber from the family hotel, brought Hallie's little like car seat adapter, and then they took a cab back to the the uh, the hotel afterwards because I think Paula realized how much it meant to me to just like yeah. be with her and, and Hallie and and uh, have that support. Not funny, obviously, but the very few people saw that <clears throat> initial from the from the hallway into the locker room and inside the locker room before we finally opened opened up and you know it's not you can't really even put it in words it, it, you know it, it like someone's going to win and someone's going to lose and and I'm sure Hamilton was like that for the two years that that they were on the other side of it but um it was like it was awful i mean grown men you know and and you know not to not to embarrass you or anything but like for, for Patty, I mean, I, I was, you know, kind of at one point kind of walked by and he, and he had his helmet and he was just swinging his helmet, just smashing his helmet again on the, on the bench, screaming, like not even screaming anything, just, just the, these screams, like awful human screams and shitty, man. It's just a well, shitty, you, shitty feeling. You said it was the worst loss of your career. Last week I talked to Drew Wolitarski when he resigned, and then Kenny, because it was Drew that brought it up in our conversation about how the guys that have been through this are going to have to, you have to deal with it somehow, right? Whether you f- can flush it and you, or you use it as fuel when you're working out, whatever. But he says, when you guys get back in training camp, got to talk about it, kind of get it out there and say, we can't let this shit happen again because it's too painful. He kept saying it crushed his soul. Yeah, I, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. That's, that's what I've been saying. It was crushing, like yeah. just a... A hollowing out loss where it took everything out of you and it just like spat it back in your face. It was, it was tough, man. Like, like I said, we, I feel like this year more than ever, we're so dedicated to making sure we got back to that game and having the opportunity to win it. And we felt like when we got to that week, we've been in the same hotel, we've been through everything before, played on that field. We know what it's like to not play the way we should have and and earn the win was incredibly tough and and there were some moments that I think everyone wants back and yeah. you can't go back in time so that's <clears throat> it's just brutal man like like Darren said I smashed my helmet it was like a brand new helmet that I had this year and I smashed it to pieces and guys were throwing shit and swearing and couldn't even couldn't fathom what had just happened like never never one time did we think we were going to lose that game when we got into it again and and we didn't do it was on us. Like we didn't do enough to win that game. It was such a range of emotions. Some guys were crying. Some guys were smashing shit. Some guys couldn't even be in the room. They're just gone. We're probably, just right? in all, in shock. Like it yeah. was. Uh, Some guys just had to get out of that room. Like you, yeah. it's there's no playbook for dealing no. with a loss like that. And for me, it it affected me for like a month afterwards. Like I couldn't couldn't think about football. I couldn't talk about football. Um, I couldn't even couldn't watch the tape and I'm someone who I, I have to watch the game as soon as I can afterwards on film and I couldn't even do that and it was bad man so like I'm, I'm glad we have guys like Drew where he can put things in perspective because you're right it, it's it's something that's going to be talked about and everyone who's going to come back from that team last year is going to have to deal with but ultimately it's going to be a new team next yeah. year and, and uh, I'm sure it'll be spoken about very little and we'll be on to you know the next season. You kind of have to deal with it up front, right? <coughs> and then yeah. it's, like you said, new season, new it's guys, you can't time to move on. The, the one thing that we, I think we've, we've tried to do as an organization is not talk about the two years that we won. It was never talked about moving into the new season. And now we've lost two in a row. You know, I think that obviously that same mentality would come into play. And right. They're really, they're really nothing to do with each other ultimately. Right. Yeah. So, Totally different, and I, I think it's it does your your new teammates a disservice. It's it's a good point. It's you know it's not fair to those guys who are coming in who are new that have to bear that, and um, it doesn't do anyone any help to dwell on things like that. I mean, it, it's you can use it individually for motivation through the off season or even in season if you want, but you can't put that on other people's shoulders. So um, I'm confident in our group that you know we'll be able to speak about it briefly, address it, and get on to it's, kick an ass for the next season. It's going to be, you know, it's a storyline right into the first week, right? Because it's going to be Montreal and it's, it's you know, it. credit to them. They 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 were better, just that much better on Great Cup Sunday. But it, it's, as much as everybody wants to flush it, it's going to keep resurfacing, right? Because it's going to come up every time we play Montreal or we get to the playoffs and, you know. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're shooting this thing January 30th, right? 
hit free agency right around the corner. You haven't had to worry about this for a while, but there's some guys right now kind of plugging away at figuring out where their where their futures are. Man, it's uh, h- what's the communication been like for for you in terms of talking to some of your guys? And I, I mean, going? if I had my way, we'd have the exact same team back. Yeah. Like, and I I want personally, like I don't know what the team is doing, but I want like my my teammates back, guys who I've gone to war with, and um guys who I break bread with and, and spend a lot of time with and form connections beyond these walls and that allows after being here too. So um, I think that's the beautiful part about being with this team. It's those kind of connections. But the ugly, shitty business of football rears its head and it can change things. And that's, that's the, I think, the feel um, from reading online and talking with guys that's going to be this year. It's going to be a, a year maybe more of change than we've seen in the past. Yeah, Darren, maybe you could uh, kind of help us out here. So Patty re-signed in almost December, uh, right? Early? I can't even remember. Oh, when was it? December, December. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, December. But the negotiating window starts on Sunday, and basically that's like a they call it the legal tampering period. But so you know, you you you're involved in a lot of this stuff, Darren. Where like is people are get start to get nervous? Here we are. It's February thirteenth when the market opens. There's a whole list of guys that haven't signed yet. But that doesn't mean we should give up on all any of those guys necessarily leaving or coming back. It's still a lot of work going on right now, right? On our current guys? Yeah. Oh shit, yeah. 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 yeah and then yeah. The, what happens on Sunday when that window opens? And it's you can start talking to whoever you want to, right? Yes. Yeah. You can. You can. Yeah. You can talk to anyone you want to, and and then you start submitting offers. Um. And you put an offer for a team yes. is bound by yes. that, yeah. yeah. Which so. I think as a player is such a, a great thing now. Like as a, as a player, um, you know, I never use it because I just want to be here, but other guys, what a great way to like understand how other teams see you and like you can kind of get a feel for where you're going to be instead of like how it used to be where you're just like some – if you have an agent, you're kind of relying on what the, what the agent's telling you. Um, or if you don't have an agent, you're going out and you're just like – Let's see what's going to happen, you know. So now it gives now it gives players, you know, a better sense of how their career is going to shape out. Because that's what I talk about with guys all the time. It's, <clears throat> you know, it's different from the football operations perspective where they're roster building. But for players, like this is our career. This is our how we feed our families, and guys guys just want to know. And and it doesn't always work out like that. So that legal tampering period um, is a nice little addition for for the players. The other thing too is like. There's so much shit that flies around this time of year, in regards to rumors and this guy might t- this this guy's gonna get this and this team's offering you know gonna offer this now how they come up with this you know is is debatable but you know for players well you you know the guy, those teams have to have to put the put their chips down you know what I mean and that's good for that's as Patty was just saying like it's not just you know we've heard a lot of things about our some of our guys and what you know what they might get and all this stuff but. We'll find out. Yeah, you know, soon enough. It kind of gives gives teams across the league clarity on your your own guys too, right? You start to see who's got interest and what the value might be. Yeah. What's interesting about this, though, and Darren, you're living this, Patty too. Um, the team has a bag of money. Let's just say here's how much we're going to spend. And so sometimes first come first serve gets a good chunk, and then the guy that might want to play the game a little bit, you get into February thirteenth. And the bag of money isn't nearly as big yeah. as it was, and you could think, uh oh, right? Yeah, I, I, unfortunately, yeah. That was always my fear. That's yeah. why, I, like, I've always tried to knock it out yeah. right away and make things easier. But I've I've heard of guys being fearful of that too. Well, it's a real thing. Yeah. It's a real thing, unfortunately. You know, um, especially if especially if you're you're wanting to be somewhere. If you're not, if you're really open to moving and open to whatever happens, as long as the the dollar amounts right or opportunity, right? Yeah, or sure. Opportunity sure. somewhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you're going to uh, transition a little bit to lighter lighter stuff. Yeah. You're going to uh, to Jake's curling tournament. Oh yeah, it's awesome. How Have the fuck? There's no way you curl. No, not well. No, well, no. It's no. I mean. It's tough, man. Like, well, I can do it, but you. No, you can't. You can't do anything athletic ever <laughs> in the history of your life. Curling is way harder than it looks on TV. So, shout out to curlers because they make it look super easy. When you're out there, man, it's hard, and it's it's difficult. 
even just getting the weight right is tough, but it's so awesome seeing Jake basically be like the mayor of Frederick. Yeah, so ex- tell us what this is. <clears throat> like, what, what, yeah, what, so what it's goes on Yeah, so Jake Thomas cur- Charity Curling Classic, and he runs this charity curling tournament that raises money for, I believe, football New yeah. Brunswick, and uh, he brings some guys on the team out as the All-Stars, and he's had guys like Matt Nichols and Andrew Harris, uh, Jesse Briggs, and I think this year it's myself, Nick Dembski, Jesse Briggs, um, now special teams coordinator Mike Miller, mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully Zach can come out and uh, we'll be out there. And they people, I think, submit bids to curl with, with the players. And um, it's like a half or three-quarter day bond spiel. And you curl, I think, four ends three times. And, and there's kind of a winner at the end. And then there's you're in the Maritimes, so there's always booze and, and people having a good time and shooting the shit. Last year they had, like, a magician come in and was doing some pretty cool stuff. So, yeah, it's, it's just a fun time. And it's, it's awesome to see Jake. <clears throat> basically running around with his hair on fire trying to like schedule things and make sure people are going to things on time and and show up when you're supposed to and uh yeah it's pretty fun <clears throat> really good time so who's going this year as i said about one minute ago i believe it's uh <laughs> i wasn't fucking listening I yeah was, sorry i was i was i was, I was, talk, I was yeah. talking to uh I was Gucci. talking to someone trying to fucking get on our team this year yes okay okay darren my change com- the subject no sorry go ahead my shitty combine or no, the no, curling no. Go tournament back, go back tell, tell me again for the There's third time about who's nick going dembski to be jesse briggs yeah hopefully zach hopefully zach and new special Mike teams coordinator new special teams coordinator mike oh, Miller, i heard about that yeah and yeah, myself yeah. you heard about him being a special no, i heard you say that oh yeah, yeah, yeah while i was zoned out not really paying attention Which, yeah okay yeah, yeah. exactly so I, I, I heard I on a po- I heard on a attention. podcast recently <clears throat> that you had the worst combine <laughs> in the history of the CFL. Is that true? It's possible. I mean, history of CFL is pretty. So, in all seriousness, you were like a, you were obviously you're 35. Yeah, 35. And <clears throat> like you clearly seem to be getting Something. playing better. Yeah, like a fine wine, which is great. Yeah. I'll so. Take it. You were a late bloomer in football, obviously, or how, like, or athletically. Yeah. No, I don't know. I have, honestly, I have no idea. I don't know why things have happened the way they did. Like, I always felt like I was a pretty good player, but I got hurt a bunch mm-hmm. in regular season in like my mid twenties. Uh, as the combine happened, like, I I thought I was going to go, and then I actually wasn't on the list of fifty when it was announced. So I was like, oh, I guess like football's done for me. You know, I'll play out my husky career and. <clears throat> enjoy that and didn't really train all that much it was just like back then with the huskies we didn't do nearly as adequate strength conditioning training as what there is now for programs and i was just kind of enjoying being a college student and being a varsity athlete and uh we were in off season mode so i wasn't training as much as i should have been and then like two weeks before the combine got announced someone two people had dropped out i guess i was number 52 on the list and i got added to the combine i was like oh this will be good <laughs> And, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I went to the Combine. I think that was the first year Dwayne Ford did his Combine, which now I think have kind of morphed into the regional Combines. Um, so, yeah, I went out there, and it was, you know, I was I was nervous as hell for it. I was not physically prepared for it as well as I should have been, I, and I knew that. There were some things I tested pretty well at, but then some other things like the bench. And I think – I don't think we were um, – yeah, the, the broad jump. Although the broad jump – Back then, they did it on a fucking carpet in a ballroom. Mm-hmm. So, like, I was, I remember guys broad jumping and like landing and skidding out on carpet and just like falling down. And they'd be like, all right, go do it again. And like, this one guy from University of Western Ontario, I think, broad jumped like five times because he kept landing and like skidding. And uh, yeah, it was just, it was, a, it was bad. But yeah, my combine wasn't great. Um, I felt like I interviewed pretty well, except for Calgary, where they basically like, said I was not adequate at all for playing in professional football. And I was like, well, I guess I'm not going to the fucking St. No thing. way. Yeah. They I was going to say, did you have any crazy interview stories? Uh, Jim Barker walked out halfway through my combine interview with them. And I think actually Osh was in the room because I think he was a special teams coordinator at the time. I don't know if he would have remembered it. I don't, th- I don't know if he was. Walked out. Like, that. what do you mean? He got up in the middle of the combine interview and left the room. And never returned. And I was like, this is weird. Like, this is this doesn't happen to any other combine. Like, got up because he had to piss because he, he was don't so know. bored? Like, what? I don't know. I don't have, honestly I have no idea. I, I just took it as like, well, I guess I'm not going to be an Argo either. Like, he just <laughs> got up and, like, walked out. So I was like, oh, fuck. Like, this is bad. And uh, Sam Peters, like, grilled me 
their their offensive line coach at the time, who's now the Argos O line coach, Chris Sweet, he like shredded me in the combine, basically saying like, "Oh, like you don't care about working out because I didn't bench well," and he's like, "You'll never be physically ready to play in this." And I kind of just like, well, like I can't really defend myself, you know, like the numbers are the numbers, and but I felt like I had pretty good tape from college, and that didn't matter to them. So I guess I wasn't going to be a Stampeder. And then I interviewed with Hamilton, and that went pretty well. I interviewed with the Bombers, who I actually probably had the best interview with, and that was Lapo. And the OC was Jamie Barisi. Uh I can't remember who the O-line coach was. It might have been Delmonico. I'm looking here. Calgary took the punter in the first round. Rob Maver. Yeah, Maver. He, but he kicked for a long time. I know, but I'm just that's saying what, it's the funny. The CFL draft's hilarious. Yeah. Yeah, like, uh, it's just like, who knows? So I think I'm the only guy left for my draft in the CFL. Well, I'm looking here now, and I don't, I don't see anybody that might. I, think I mean, the I Bombers' think first one. pick was in the second round. was Corey Watson. Yeah. That's a while ago. Um, yeah, I'm just scrolling through here. but Yeah, so I had a really good interview with, with the Bombers, and I thought I was going to get drafted to them. And then um, the Rough Riders called me on my cell phone and I had a really good interview with them too. And I was like, fuck, I have no idea what's going to happen. You know, I could get drafted. I could be a free agent acquisition kind of thing, or I could just not, nothing could happen, you know? And I was kind of cool with that. And then I remember it was during uh, our university spring camp and it was in the middle of our scrimmage. And I gave my mom my cell phone basically if like something happens, just flag me down. And uh, it was, I, I think third pick in the fifth round and um round five yeah yeah she like stood up and screamed and my agent at the time was on the phone said i got drafted by the riders and that was it then i somehow i was like i tricked them <laughs> got in there <laughs> despite having the worst combine in the world i well like, those aren't my words <laughs> whose words were they uh, eddie was telling me about it <laughs> yeah we were on a podcast. he who shall not be named yeah. um yeah i mean fuck whatever i didn't have a great great combine but I knew I could play. Like, yeah. I, I love well, football. Well, obviously. Yeah, I love football. I knew I could play. I think I needed some physical maturation. So this was kind of the cool thing that helped me out that was an interesting thing for the CFL is that I could go to training camp as a professional athlete, go through training camp, and then I went back to school. So that, that three-week-long training camp I had with the Riders like, accelerated my game beyond any – college football programming I ever had. So when, when I went back to school, I had a, an unreal season. Like, we were, we were a really good team. We shit the bed in the playoffs, but um, I was a first team All-Canadian, and I somehow lost lineman of the year to Paul Swiston, who was a second team All-Canadian. So I was like, how does this even make sense? And, like, Swiston's a great dude, and we got to be teammates for a bit here in Winnipeg, but I was like, how am I a first team All-Canadian, and he's a second team All-Canadian, and he's – the Metris nominee for for the Can West. It didn't really make sense to me, but <coughs> he was here when you when you got here. Yeah, holy in 13, fuck, you've been here a long 13 time. Thirteen and fourteen. I think Swiston's last year here was fourteen. That's unbelievable. That seems like well, it's a lifetime in, ago. Yeah, I got here in October of twenty thirteen. What were your first thoughts? <laughs> this is wild. Alex Hall trade. Yeah, yeah I remember. I, remember, I had to I sit remember in his hap- locker. It happened in Calgary. We we made the, the trade happen in Calgary. We had a game in Calgary. We probably lost like fifty five to three or something like that. <laughs> yeah. It was wild. It's an ugly. That was an ugly season, twenty thirteen. I mean, I'm actually not kidding. I think I think that was the game that that uh, Brandon Collier maybe, and I don't mean to shun him because he's actually doing awesome now. I don't know if it was him. It might not have been him. It actually would surprise me if it was him. Thinking back, and it was kind of one of those things that was it just looked bad. Do you remember the laughing on the on the on the TV? I was covering so, hockey then, so oh, I don't remember. Right, well, Sorry, it. hockey. Yeah. Yeah. So okay, so we were so it was like Sorry. honest, honest to God, it was like fifty. It was like we were losing. It was ugly. Like maybe not fifty, but it was ugly. And and you know, like it was October. I think this is the October game. And it was yeah. And the the be- the camera panned to the bench and and I don't know if who it was, but they they caught a defensive lineman laughing. Yeah, it's not a good look. And like you probably shouldn't be laughing anyway. At that whatever. I don't know what possibly could be funny, but like someone could have told a joke. It just looks bad, right? It's just a bad look. But I mean, you can't just be like sad the whole. No, time. I know, of course not. So, but because when the, we had won, we had won like four games over two seasons. Yeah. And the fans are the fans are were sick of this shit, yeah. and this happens. It's just like oh god, there's another thing, and then we go we go back go back to the Western, <clears> and and uh, that's when it was done. The trade happens. Crazy. 
Alex Hall for Pat Newfeld. There were yeah, some I think draft a couple picks draft picks, yeah. yeah. A couple draft picks. Yeah. And uh, that was that was like that that's insane to me. That was 11 yeah. years ago. I was in a corn maze. I remember you saying I was this. in a fucking corn maze on a day off <laughs> and I got a text from <laughs> Brendan Taman who was the GM at the time of the Riders and then like a missed phone call because I was in a corn maze in a valley where there's no goddamn reception. Just having a nice time. I'm recovering from a broken leg, and uh, I get a text. Did they know it was broken at that point? Who? Saskatchewan? Well, what I think had happened is it healed, and then it kind of, like, rebroke. and oh, then I see. They okay. Just okay. So you, sorry to cut you off. So you get the text. Please, hey, this is Brendan Taman. Please call me at your earliest convenience. And then I get a text from my agent at the time saying, hey, you have to call me right now. So I... Basically, I'm, like, frantic here. I'm, like, I'm aware of the trade deadline, and um, I know who's playing really well in my position. And then when I came back and played, I didn't play that well because I played a guard, which I'd never played before. So I'm panicking. I'm trying to find the fucking exit to a goddamn corn maze to get out of it. <laughs> and I'm, like, this is the biggest phone call I have to deal with, and I can't get out. Did you did you, did you know what, like, did you I know what was coming? I had an idea. I, was, I got super nervous, and uh, all of a sudden, Paula just, like, Went right through the middle of it. She just, like, hauled ass through the middle of the corn maze, like, forged her own path. We got out, got out of the valley, and then had the call. And then I remember standing next to my uh, truck, and I called Taman, and he's like, hey, you're sitting down? And I'm like, yep. <laughs> and I was standing outside, and he's like, we've traded you to the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for Alex Hall and a draft pick. And I was like, oh, fuck. And then I'm pretty sure I said, is there anything I can do to stay? No. <laughs> I was like, yeah. That I was, was a like, good team that year, right? Yeah. We were They're good. like, ended up winning the, the great time. Cup. Yeah. That was a great cup. Oh, team. what an answer. Well, I just, I didn't want to leave. And like, that was my hometown team. I was yeah. super pumped to play there. But uh, yeah, things worked out. Yeah. You can kind of, that's a yeah. quick but way I haven't, to sum it up. I haven't Holy gone shit. To, I haven't gone to a out. corn maze ever since. Fuck those things. <laughs> Uh, this segment brought to you by the corn maze. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Never again. So any so and then you got here and we won't go through the whole thing, but you got here and and y- you were miserable. I was wild. I wasn't. I mean, I wasn't miserable, but I was. Well, just it was. Like, a, it was. It was quite the operation. I was. was I was lucky here. that when I got here, I knew two guys: uh, Rory Colhert and Jade Etienne. So I actually ended up living in the same house with them. So I didn't stay in the team hotel. <clears throat> I stayed with those guys, and then I met another guy named Carl Fitzgerald who. Uh, played here for a couple of years and turned out to be a good buddy. And uh, that helped, like, knowing those dudes. But, like, it was just – it was different. It was a team that was looking for an identity, a team that was just trying to find anything to get a win, players, coaching, um, whatever it was. It wasn't good. And then I remember – I can't remember. It was sometime that year, I think very close to when I got traded, that Wade became the president and CEO. Yeah, it would have been uh, – because Wade was there when you when the trade ha- went down. It was at a uh, uh, fuck Cactus Club because Calgary have Cactus Club. Plug in so we can eat there for free next yeah, time. Yeah, they, yeah. they don't. They overcharge that place. Okay, but uh, well, yeah. but uh, <laughs> strike that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, yeah. Wade was there. It was yeah. Wade was there when it happened. So th- this was two months in. So I remember because his first meetings. <laughs> yes, I remember his first. Well, I remember a meeting. I don't know if it was probably it was meeting. probably the end of the season. Yeah, honestly. so maybe it was his first meeting. And he walked in, and, and I mean, I didn't know. I knew who Wade was because he had played in the CFL, but I like didn't know what he looked like. And so he walked in, and he basically stood in front of the team, and he's like, "This is not a good year. Some of you have basically cut yourselves. <laughs> some of you will be here, and some of you will be here to try out, and it was something else like that." But I vividly remember him saying, "Some of you have cut yourselves," and. I was like, I can probably pick 25 guys who had done that. Sure. Like, sure. there was so many dudes that were just there stealing checks, like, go out for walkthrough, come back in and play cards and not be out there for practice. And, like, one game, one of our defensive ends was sitting in the crowd <laughs> eating chicken fingers <laughs> with the fans and not even on the bench. And he was, like, drinking and yelling at people. And I was like – Yelling at the team. Ye- yelling at the team. He was sitting behind our bench. Eating chicken fingers, drinking, and like yelling at us. And I like talked to I think Jade or Rory. I was like, "Is that so and so?" And they're like, "Yep." I was like, "Oh fuck!" Like, well, now a couple weeks much. later, that's when Osh would have been hired, then, right? 
after the after season. That, yeah. After that after speech. After the season, yeah. From yeah, way, yeah, after yeah, that yeah, speech yeah. From So way. I had a conversation with my agent at the time, too, and I was, I was like, man, this is fucking bad. Like, this is – it's not good. He's like, so what are you thinking? I was like, I don't know, man. He's like, dude, like, you can submit retirement papers and wait a year. You can – stick it out and I was like well I'll see like who the head coach is and what's going to ha- happen and then when they hired Osh I was like yeah that's that's awesome like I'm gonna gonna play this thing through and see it through and then when they hired Wiley I was like oh yeah like there's I I've heard of heard of Wiley uh Brendan Labatt he he was coached by Wiley here I think his second year and he said like he's the best coach he's ever had and then when Wiley came here by far the best coach I've ever had I don't. I don't have much else, man. I feel like we've uh, your second or third time around here. So yeah, uh, we got to remember though. Hopefully, you're gonna. We'll talk later because the combine is in Winnipeg. You brought it up. The combines in Winnipeg. Combine. And I mean, I brought this up. We were sitting there watching football the other day, and we're like, "What are we going to talk about in this podcast?" And I said, "Well, we'll talk about your career." And he says, "Well, fuck, nobody wants to hear about that. They already heard about that." <laughs> And and I, I said, okay, well, we'll talk about your shitty combine. He's like, I don't want to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, I can be a, a shining example of what not to do for the combine athletes. But I think I have a unique perspective on it because I was a guy that went through it. and Absolutely. You, you know. And, buddy, I, I, I mean that. Like, I, I wasn't – like, it's kind of an interesting story because, like, it didn't go well at the time. And yeah. then you've turned into – well, and yeah, and it's worked out. Yeah, it's it worked, worked out. out. Shit never works out in life. This is good. <laughs> it is good. Was it last year you had that kind of that internship with the league or two years? Yeah, yeah last year it was like, the. So uh, your perspective is changing too because as a guy that's kind of a football mm-hmm. junkie, right? Yeah, I love it. So and you'll go and to I the combine to watch. Yeah, yeah like I, I love the CFL and I, I have a massive amount of respect for it and reverence for people who are involved and, and make it operate. And within our team, a amount of respect for everyone doing this stuff. And. I, I wanted to kind of see how things ran from the office perspective. And um, when they asked for this internship program, I think a couple guys on our team applied for it, and hopefully they get in. Um, they ask you, like, why specifically do you want to go? And for me, it was actually about the combine. It was about, like, why do team – why is the combine run the way that it is? Wh- how can the league make the combine better for players, and how can the – league make the combine better for teams like can make it more efficient for teams or more specific for what the teams want and what the team see because obviously the cfl combine is much different than the nfl combine i never i don't think i have any canadian teammates who went to the nfl combine i think i have a couple american guys who who went but it's totally different you know they like the fact that there's on-field portions and pads and guys are like doing one-on-ones and and seven on seven stuff you know so <clears throat> I wanted to know why things were done and, and kind of gave my perspective on the combine and how it could be better. And, you know, that was that was something important to me and, and something I'm looking forward to seeing here in town because it is kind of cool. You know, it's a cool it's a cool couple days. And, and for a lot of guys, I put myself in their shoes. I was like, I remember being nervous. I remember, like, this is the CFL combine. Like, this is a big deal. This is a job interview. And, and uh you know, it's going to be exciting for a lot of those guys. And, and selfishly, like I always root for guys who come from U of S. So it's going to be good to see some of those kids out there competing. Good, man. Yeah. Well, hey. Appreciate you doing uh, this. You're off in to uh, – so who's going to that curling tournament again? I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, have a good time, brother. Thanks, oh, it'll be great to see Thanks, those guys. And, Thanks, guys. Uh, appreciate appreciate it. you coming on. Appreciate it, man. All right. Thanks. Thanks.